Okay, great. We shall get started. So hello, everyone. Good morning, afternoon, evening. Uh, it's great to see people joining from, I can think of at least five countries right now. So this is uh, very exciting and international. Um, it's uh, good to see you back at an Aspire webinar. Um, you may or may not know me. My name is Yael Shapira. I'm Olam's Director of Network Engagement and Programs, and I'm based in Washington, D.C. Um, and I will give a bit of introduction before we start with our presenter and presentation. So for those of you who do not know our Aspire program very well, or this is your first time, I'll give a very brief overview of the program. Aspire is our ethical practices program that is for our 65 plus partner organizations and all of their staff and for our individual members. And it's great to see both partners and members on this call. Um, it's a holistic program that provides various resources um, and tools that allow our partners to look at the way they do their work and try to learn and grow and um, adopt more ethical practices that will help the impact um, on the people that they serve. And so if you go to Alam's website, you will see various Not useful um, tools and resources, um, starting with the ethical best practices spectrums. We have a spectrum for each of our four topics that we're focus focus focusing on this year. So ethical communications, uh, ethical monitoring and evaluation of programs, um, ethical um, global volunteering and community engagement. Um, and in those spectrums, you can really see the kind of 10 commandments or key guidelines for how to do um, the most ethical work in those fields. And it's something that I really um, encourage you to take a look at and look at with your team and have conversations. Because I think it's a, it's a really nice way to see where you're doing really well and where you could still improve. Um, for our partner organizations that have taken our self-assessment survey, you have access to up to $1,500 a year in microgrants to um, improve your ethical practices. And on our website, there's a lot of information of how that could work, including bringing on consultants, um, supporting team meetings and more. We also have additional resources collected from different organizations and different institutes. We're not here to invent the wheel. So we want to provide you with what already exists on the global level relating to international standards in international development um, global volunteering and humanitarian aid. And finally, our calendar of events is where you can both see upcoming webinars and RSVP and also have the recordings of all our previous webinars from the past year, some of which are really, really excellent. And I encourage you and your team to take some time and watch them together. Just to let you know, coming soon, we're excited to be launching in the new year, a new and our fifth Aspire topic, which will be around ethical climate practices. So how you take climate into account, both internally in your organizations and in your um, partnerships and community um, communities where you work. We're going to relaunch the self-assessment survey that allows our partner organizations to answer questions and then kind of get a score to see where they sit and again, where they can possibly improve. Uh, and keep your eyes out for information about additional webinars um, about our different topics in the new year. And as I said, in the meantime, we really encourage you to watch some of the webinar recordings um, and review the website because I'm sure you can all find something that will benefit you. So moving on to today's webinar, we are going to focus on the topic of ethical monitoring and evaluation, specifically around feedback loops. So um, this is our eighth commandment within the ethical uh, monitoring and evaluation spectrum, where we talk about including a feedback loop to ensure accountability to the communities with which you work throughout your project's life cycle. So we talk about putting in place systems and incentives for easily receiving feedback from stakeholders, and you should make uh, needed adjustments in real time rather than waiting until the next project to implement lessons learned. So today we're gonna to dive deep into this specific commandment or topic and you'll uh, hopefully learn a lot about it. With that, I'm really pleased to um, introduce our speaker today, Alexis Banks. She is a, a Senior manage, Manager of Learning and Operations at Feedback Labs. So this is uh, what she does all day and breathes in feedback and I'm excited to pass it along to her uh, and uh, hear more of uh, everything you could teach us. Thanks so much, Alexis. 
Awesome. Thanks, Yael. Uh, and hello, everyone. Uh, let me go ahead and pull up my slides. I'm really excited to be here with you, and thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this conversation uh, about feedback and how it impacts your work. Um, as Yael mentioned, my name is Alexis. I lead our learning programs here at Feedback Labs, where our mission is to make feedback the norm and aid philanthropy and nonprofits. And we do that by offering trainings like this one, by building a community of feedback practitioners through our membership and regular convenings, like our upcoming annual summit. Um, and then we also curate a collection of feedback tools and work with others in the sector to create incentives for uh, using feedback in our work and prioritizing the voices of our constituents um, in our programming. So just a quick overview of, of what we'll talk about today. First, I have a poll uh, in just a moment and would love a chance just to get to know where you are in your current feedback journey within your organization. Uh, then I'll just briefly talk about how feedback compares to and overlaps with monitoring and evaluation. Um, I'll make a case for feedback, so why we think it's impactful and important in your work, uh, and talk about the things that hold us back from using feedback in our work. Um, and then most importantly, I'll dive into the six phases of the feedback loop, which is the uh, methodology that we promote here at Feedback Labs. Uh, we'll wrap up with a QA. and a um, And then if we have time, I have some discussion questions, but what's most important to me is that we get to your questions. Um, so throughout the presentation, feel free to ask clarifying questions in the chat box. Um, we will hold kind of questions that are specific to your organization towards the end, but I really am happy to hang out afterwards. I love spending time talking about feedback, so very happy to, to get into uh, any questions you have that are unique to your organization. And speaking of which, I'd love to hear uh, how you would describe your organization's current feedback practice. So for folks who arrived a little early, I already shared this poll link. If you arrived uh, in the past few minutes, maybe take a moment to uh, answer this poll question. But I, as you can see, I've asked you, how would you describe your organization's feedback practice? I can see more than half of you so far say that you think you do a good job, but it's not necessarily systematic. Uh, so today we'll talk about some strategies for creating a cyclical feedback process. Um, it's a loop because um, it once it ends, it starts all over again. Um, we'll also talk about some strategies for getting buy-in from the right staff uh, to make sure that it can be budgeted for, that it can be a part of your regular processes. Um, it looks like uh, there are still some other folks in the room that share, uh, maybe you like the idea of feedback, but haven't gotten started yet. That's okay. We'll be introducing how to do feedback. Um, and then others have shared, we do a good job collecting feedback, but we don't do much with it after. I know that is like where the rubber hits the road and that's the, the challenging piece. We'll talk about that, particularly as we get into the course correct phase. Um, and then really excited to hear there's a handful of people that say we do a great job collecting feedback and we close the loop every time. Um, congratulations and would uh, love to hear more towards the end of today's session about what that looks like for you. So thanks everyone for just kind of giving me a sense of how, you, how you're coming into this conversation about feedback. Um, and shifting gears a little bit, let me tell you what we mean by feedback here at Feedback Labs. Um, so when we talk about feedback, we are referring to the thoughts, feelings, and perceptions from people at the heart of our work about our products and services their, and their impact. Uh, and feedback is used to influence related activities in the future. Uh, we, that, we believe that for feedback to be truly effective, uh, we need to close the loop. And so uh, I'll be talking today about this feedback loop methodology, which includes uh, six phases. Um, it's kind of hard to see buy-in is the phase that's encompassing that entire loop that's getting continuous buy-in from uh, your constituents, from leadership, staff, and donors. Um, and then the, the loop itself includes designing a process that is contextualized and appropriate for your specific stakeholders, uh, collecting feedback in a way that makes sense for them, um, and that's going to uh, kind of surface responses from marginalized communities, for example, uh, analyzing feedback to generate actionable insights, and then clarifying what you've heard through dialogue. Um, that's a step that, 
that we uh, often find isn't necessarily incorporated yet. So excited to tell you more about that. Uh, and then finally, course correcting. So actually making changes in response to the feedback that you've heard and uh, reporting back to constituents that have participated in the feedback process but how their feedback was used and what changes they can expect to see as a result. Um, and as, as I've mentioned before, it's called a feedback loop because it's meant to be cyclical and carried out ideally before, during, and after a program or project. So I know um, that part of this webinar was kind of talking about how feedback compares to and overlaps with or even sits within monitoring and evaluation. And so I wanted to share this Venn diagram of how we kind of see the relationship between feedback and M&E. Um, so in M&E, uh, as you know, we're collecting and analyzing information about people's quality of life. We're looking at program outputs and outcomes, such as whether individuals have access to clean drinking water. Uh, we're looking at things like their level of reading proficiency or employment status. Um, it can be collected from many sources. It doesn't necessarily have to come from the individual themselves. Feedback, on the other hand, always comes from constituents. It includes their thoughts, feelings, and perceptions about their quality of life um, and the services that have been provided with the goal of improving that quality of life. Um, so we might ask things like, how satisfied are you with, the, with your access to clean drinking water? Uh, or how satisfied are you with the services provided by the local water utility? What ideas do you have for how to improve your access to quality drinking water? Um, or, or how do you uh, recommend we strengthen the, the programs being offered by the local utility, for example? Uh, so high quality feedback processes also ask for constituents recommendations for how to implement or improve a program. Uh, it's clarified through dialogue with constituents and the results are reported back to constituents. Uh, while M&E results can be shared externally, um, they're typically used internally to understand impact. Um, so that, those are some of the kind of distinctions that we see. Um, when done well, both monitoring and evaluation and feedback are carried out continuously throughout a program and used to inform adaptation. Um, and so at Feedback Labs, we like to say that feedback is right smart and feasible. Uh, in just a moment, I'm going to talk about how it's smart, meaning that it uh, we believe that it leads to better programmatic outcomes that helps save you time and money. Um, I'll also talk about how it's feasible. So using the, the feedback loop methodology, how is it feasible to do at scale? Um, but first, I just wanted to briefly touch on why we think feedback is right morally and ethically. Um, and that's because feedback enables us to make choices and decisions with our constituents. Uh, our communities and our clients, and not necessarily uh, about them or on their behalf. Um, and in listening and acting on what we hear, we're demonstrating that respect that we have for the people that we work with, um, the communities that we seek to serve, and we're beginning to build power within our uh, constituency um, and working towards co-creating uh, solutions together. And so again, we see feedback as something that could be part of m and &E, but it may also be distinct. Um, and it kind of depends on your particular organization and the particular scope of your uh, feedback process. Okay. And hi, welcome folks who are still joining. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about that SMART aspect I was just mentioning. And um, so I said, we'd like to talk about feedback as uh, right, smart, and feasible. And we think it's uh, smart because evidence shows that feedback can be used to identify the most effective solutions to the needs of people at the heart of our work. It can save us valuable time and money, and it can help identify whose needs aren't being met and emphasize diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so let's just look at a quick example of each of those uh, reasons that feedback is smart. Um, so as I mentioned, feedback helps you achieve better results and can improve your programmatic outcomes. So for example, incorporating community feedback into the evaluation of schools in Uganda reduced teacher absenteeism by 13% and uh, student test scores improved um, significantly from the 50th to the 80th or the 58th percentile. 
and happy to um, share resources where you can read more about uh, this research on our website. These are like snapshots um, of these examples. Um, it can also be used to save valuable time and money. So looking at this example, the Center for Employment Opportunities found that participants who responded to feedback surveys were five to 10% more likely to be employed 90 or 180 days after their initial employment. And so this allows the staff of CEO to target their outreach and work specifically to participants that aren't engaging in feedback processes and to personally reach out to see if there are ways to improve those individuals' experiences. It not only improves outcomes for participants, but it also allows staff to really target their time, um, saving them valuable staff time and resources. And then lastly, um, looking at this final example, um, at the beginning of COVID, the Greater Minneapolis Council of Churches launched a prepared meal distribution effort, uh, which it quickly adapted in response to what it heard from residents representing the area's Somali refugee community. The organization learned that many participants, because of their experience with unsafe food at refugee camps, were rejecting cold and frozen delivered meals. The executive director shared that while it was actually safer, not just easier to deliver cold and frozen meals, they listened carefully and understood that this was a matter of building trust uh, and partnering with this particular community. So they changed their systems to deliver warm meals safely. And this example demonstrates how feedback can be used as a force for equity. Um, and that by doing things like analyzing our data to look at the different experiences of our constituents, they were able to respond to the needs of a marginalized community, adapting their program um, accordingly. So uh, you might be thinking if feedback is so great and there's all this evidence that it works, um, why isn't everyone already doing it? Uh, and so we talk about three myths that hold us back from feedback in our organizations. The first is I won't be able to respond to the feedback that I receive. The second is I don't have the time or resources to carry out a feedback process. And the third is I'm alone in thinking this is important. And so I'd be interested to hear if any of these arguments resonate with your experience at your organization, if any of these are things that might be holding you back. Um, and so I'm gonna share a poll in just a moment. And then I'd love to hear if one of the three arguments that I just shared about why feedback is smart might help in tackling uh, the challenges that, that might be hindering feedback within your organization. So I'm gonna launch another poll and it's actually the exact same link. So I'll share that in the chat box again and would love to hear um, if any of those three myths hinder your feedback practice. Um, and if anyone does respond, none of the above, um, feel free to throw in the chat box um, what other things might be holding you back from uh, using feedback to its full potential within your organization. Okay, great. So, so far, we're seeing a lot of folks sharing, I don't have the time or resources. Um, so happy, hopefully you'll walk away today feeling like, okay, I have some additional um, uh, knowledge base resources and happy to talk to you about um, some time-saving ways to implement feedback loops. Um, and also seeing several folks say, I won't be able to respond to it. Um, so we'll talk specifically about the dialogue phase as that opportunity to really clarify and prioritize the feedback we're hearing from constituents. Um, we'll also talk about how buy-in can be a way to really ensure that you're entering a feedback process with the right buy-in from the right people to make changes based on what you hear. Um, I'm seeing some folks say all of the above, all three of those things feel like they're maybe holding you back. Hopefully that won't be the case following today's webinar. Um, and then again, I see about a third of us are sharing none of those things are, are holding us back. Um, so feel free if you'd like to share in the chat box, is that because you feel like you have moved beyond a place where you're being held back and you're, you're well on your way to implementing feedback effectively, or are there other things that are hindering your feedback practice? Uh, feel free to throw that in the chat box um, as we get ready to head into our next poll, which is again at that same link. Um, so we'd love to hear as you think about what might be um, kind of preventing you from using feedback as much as you'd like within your organization, 
if any of the three arguments uh, that I just shared um, would be useful or would resonate with you um, in making the case for feedback within your work. Um, so once again, those, are, those arguments are that feedback improves outcomes, that feedback can help uh, target your programs or adapt your programs to save valuable time and money, and then lastly, feedback can help you identify whose needs aren't being met. And it looks like that last argument is the one that's standing out to folks the most right now, um, which I'm really excited to hear. And it's a big shift that we're, we've really noticed at Feedback Labs in the past few years, as there's been a greater uh, focus on equity. Um, we as a nonprofit community are coming to realize that feedback is a really critical tool for strengthening equity in our programming and identifying whose needs aren't being met and adapting programs, in some cases, to respond to the needs of the minority, not necessarily the majority, which is really interesting. Um, and then uh, and another handful, so about a third of folks are sharing all of those things are useful arguments for making the case for feedback within your work. Awesome. Well, thanks for sharing a little bit about um, how this resonates with you within your organization. We're going to shift gears now to talk about the closed feedback loop methodology itself. And so as I'm talking through this, um, my plan is to both just kind of walk you through the feedback loop and what each of these steps looks like, share some tips for implementing each of the different phases of the feedback loop, and also some examples of what it's looked like for other organizations. Um, and again, feel free if you do have clarifying questions or things you'd like to learn more about to share that in the chat, um, and we'll have a chance to hear more about what this looks like at your organization in our discussion. So. As I mentioned before, uh, we find that to be able to truly act on feedback effectively, we need to use a closed feedback loop. Um, and so we call it closing the loop when an organization reports back what they heard and how they plan to act in response to the feedback that they've received. And so we're going to talk through each of those six steps uh, right now. So I want to kick off the feedback loop by really emphasizing the importance of building buy-in even before you start designing your feedback process. Buy-in is the continuous process of building trust with key stakeholders and fostering interest in participating in the feedback process. For program participants or local partners, buy-in involves ongoing relationship building that starts long before we ask for feedback. Once we've taken the time to build rapport, we can begin building trust in the feedback process itself. It helps to ensure that constituents know that they have the right to give feedback, and that they're able to give feedback freely without negative repercussions. Creating this safe environment helps foster a more feasible and reliable process and increases the accuracy and quality of our feedback. And we can build buy-in with constituents and local partners by involving them in the process design um, through things like uh, thinking through when that should happen, what questions we might ask, and even testing out the feedback process before we launch it, uh, by being transparent about how the data will be used, and by demonstrating over and over again that we can be trusted to act on the feedback and report back on what we hear. Um, so we really find that buy-in continues to increase over time as we really demonstrate that we are acting on feedback um, and we are taking that step to report back exactly what we heard and what changes we made as a result. Buy-in from staff allows you to cultivate trust, particularly from frontline staff who might feel threatened by the idea of feedback, thinking that it could negatively reflect on them or make their jobs harder. Uh, and we foster buy-in from staff by getting their input from the start on the scope of the feedback process, discussing together what changes are we really able and willing to make, and involving them in the analysis, the follow-up dialogue, and determining how to course correct together. And I'm imagining that that, that probably resonates, um, that your colleagues would be um, dissatisfied if suddenly uh, you were asking questions about their work uh, that they had little say in, or making changes to programs that they run um, that they're not able to um, decide with you. Um, and then lastly, buy-in from senior leadership enables you to translate feedback into actionable change through budget and strategy changes and lends legitimacy to the process for frontline staff and constituents. So when you have that leadership buy-in from the start, people really have more trust in the process overall. 
Some other groups that you might want buy-in from are your donors. So letting them know upfront that you expect to adapt your program along the way in response to feedback. That means you won't be able to stick to a rigid program plan. And that's not only okay, it's better and more effective. Um, and you may also need buy-in from key stakeholders like local government or community leaders to let them know, hey, we're gonna be asking folks in your community for feedback. Um, and we're gonna be having conversations about this. You can expect to see a report of the results. So that's a, a quick overview of that really critical process of buy-in, which is something that we do at the beginning, but also we continue to do throughout and even after the feedback process ends. And then next is the design phase. So this is when we identify the what, who, and how of our feedback process. The what is the key topic, issue, or program that you want feedback about. Um, and remember to only ask for feedback on things that you truly plan to act on. The who is your target audience and the contextual factors that you need to consider to enable them to provide you with feedback, such as language, literacy, technology access, um, or cultural or power dynamics. So for example, um, if you're thinking about timing limitations on your feedback pro process because of cultural limitations, um, if for example, you work with a large Hindu community um, that you're trying to reach, it would not be appropriate to collect feedback during Diwali, for example. Um, so thinking about who are the members of our community that will be engaging in feedback and how does that impact our overall design? And then lastly, given their context, what's the best way to reach your constituents? Uh, what financial or other resources will you need to carry out your feedback process? And so those are all things that we begin thinking about as part of the design before we even jump into collecting, analyzing, or acting on feedback. And just to share a quick example of how context matters, I wanted to talk about Children International. Uh, which rolled out feedback loops in 13 locations around the world. And as you can imagine, their designs really differed by context. So in Delhi, the team surveyed constituents with low literacy levels using flip charts and sticky dots with a smiley face spectrum. Uh, they kept the surveys public and pretty informal, so parents didn't fear that their answers might impact the services that they and their children received. On the other hand, in the Dominican Republic, the team sent out uh, surveys via mobile phones, um, which made more sense for that particular community. And they hosted follow-up dialogues, which used really fun, interactive um, uh, icebreakers um, that probably wouldn't translate well into the American context, for example. Um, so here's an organization that, that actually had pretty similar feedback goals in every location, but the design looked really different uh, depending on the country that they were working in. Okay, so we've talked a lot about like, what's the work we do up front to build trust and buy-in, to start like planning for and thinking about our feedback process. Um, and now we can kind of jump into uh, thinking about how we want to collect that initial feedback. Um, so when we talk about collect, we need to determine a collection method. Uh, such as a survey, which I know is always our go-to, uh, but there are also focus groups, interviews, and other really creative methods of collecting feedback, like voting through marbles, um, or I've seen like some really cool like paper airplane activities. Um, and uh, we'll also need to decide on the feedback and demographic questions that we want to ask to generate actionable insights. I wanna pause here to acknowledge that collecting demographic data on race, gender, geography, religion, and more can be sensitive and uncomfortable, but is so critical for using feedback to foster equity in our work. Uh, some things to consider here are the vocabulary that communities use to refer to themselves. So for example, while uh, Latinx or Latin uh, are commonly used in advocacy settings, some research has shown that communities uh, themselves might use terms like Hispanic or Latino and might be more comfortable identifying themselves as that on a survey. Um, so those are some things to test out in advance and a really good example of what it looks like to partner with your community to create a feedback process. We also want to contextualize why we're asking for demographic data and how it will be used to evaluate our own ability to foster equity and inclusion and not 
to in any way make decisions about who receives services, for example. Um, and we might wanna consider making those questions optional just to really signal to folks, um, this is not something you have to provide about yourself, but really a way that we're evaluating our own programmatic work and outcomes. And then finally, as you're thinking about the questions themselves, we recommend that you keep your surveys brief. I'm talking about like three to five questions uh, to drive participation and surface actionable insights that will lead to genuine adaptation. Um, so remember here that our goal is always to act on all of the feedback we receive. And so I often find that when we're asking questions beyond like five feedback questions, we find that it's really challenging to act on all of the feedback that we receive, um, which is why we recommend kind of carrying out micro surveys or um, short and rapid feedback loops that allow you to really ensure everything you've collected on, you're able to analyze, clarify through dialogue, and really act on. Um, so another good reason to keep those uh, feedback questions limited. Okay. Um, so we just talked about collect, and so shifting gears, want to talk about that analyze stage. Um, so during the analyze stage, you will make sense of the feedback that you've received by disaggregating or segmenting responses by demographic data, such as race, gender, uh, identity, or age, to surface different experiences. You might also cross-tabulate your data to see if you notice trends between questions. So for example, are respondents who are relatively less satisfied with your organization also uncomfortable surfacing issues or concerns with staff? Um, so pulling out common trends and themes between questions or uh, along demographic lines might help you identify questions to ask in your follow-up dialogue, um, but also maybe important course corrections that are needed within uh, your programs. Another technique you might use is benchmarking your responses, uh, which allows you to compare results across programs or across organizations, um, or might allow for a more longitudinal study that compares feedback over time. So for example, if you're asking the same question um, year over year or every few months, comparing those results to see how are things changing. Um, and that might be a good way to see, to check back in, to say, we made this change, are you seeing a difference? How would you rate us now on this um, to, again, evaluate the impact of your own course corrections? Uh, I also just want to share that a lot of feedback platforms will do this basic analysis for you. And the level of sophistication is going to depend on your team's need uh, and your staff capacity. I, for example, am not a data person and I work for a pretty small organization. So I typically use the analysis phase to generate some key insights that I can use to facilitate a more in-depth feedback dialogue. Um, and that's the phase of the loop that I actually find most valuable um, and I'm excited to talk about in just a minute. Okay, so let's take just a quick look at an example of what analysis might look like. Um, this is analysis generated on the Feedback Commons platform um, for anyone who's interested in, in checking out one of our many tools. Um, also, if you are looking for tools, we have a tools repository on our website if you're looking to find out what other feedback tools are out there to help you facilitate your feedback process or your analysis. Um, but taking a look at this example, this survey question came from Keystone Accountability's work in Malawi. Following a workshop with local community-based organizations, uh, NGOs, and the local Malawian government, uh, as well as community structures such as village chiefs, Keystone asked participants if, together, they had achieved a more equal way of working together. And you can see here that they segmented responses by organization and institution type, which allowed them to surface differences in experience in the workshop. And so they were able to determine that community structures, like traditional leaders, religious leaders, and community members, felt that they had not yet achieved a more equal way of working together when compared to other groups like the local government. Um, so that's a really interesting insight that might inform future workshop designs or um, if this is something that, that they asked mid-workshop, might be an opportunity for them to course correct uh, and adapt the workshop itself going forward. Okay, we're almost done with the feedback loop. I know I'm talking a ton, so thank you so much for sticking with me. Um, I think this is my favorite slide. These are my two favorite steps of the feedback loop. I think this is when it gets really fun. Um, 
So just want to share that it's really critical not to stop at that analyze phase, but to really keep going uh, and think about clarifying, verifying, and refining your understanding through dialogue, and then of course making changes in response to feedback. So first, during the dialogue phase, we are going to report back what we found in the analyze phase and dig deeper by verifying, clarifying, and refining our understanding of our constituents' feedback and co-creating solutions together. Um, we ask questions like, why do you think 50% of respondents said they are not satisfied with our after-school program? Or what actions can we take to address this feedback? Or of the ideas we've generated together, which ones should we prioritize for immediate action? I often hear people saying like, I left the dialogue feeling inundated with ideas, um, of kind of where to go next. And what's cool is we can actually use that space and time to work with our constituents to prioritize together. Um, we can share some of our limitations and um, invite them into the process of making decisions about what comes next. As you're designing your dialogue, you'll wanna think about how to create a safe, trusting environment for a conversation, who should and shouldn't be in the room. Uh, you'll wanna coach staff to resist the urge to explain why things are the way they are or to push back on feedback and instead use the time to ask follow-up and clarifying questions uh, to better understand the feedback and to build rapport. So for example, um, if a parent were to share it's challenging for me to get to uh, the after school program at 5 p.m. because of my work schedule. Rather than saying, well, the reason that we do that is because school ends at this time, um, instead would be to ask clarifying questions like, at what time would, or what time would work best for you? Uh, or what are some alternatives that we could explore that would be better for your work schedule? Um, and so again, using that time to ask more questions to surface more ideas, um, rather than explaining why things are the way they are. Um, consider taking notes publicly so participants can see how interpreting their how you're interpreting their feedback, um, what actions you plan to take, and might even point out things that you may have misunderstood. Um, by taking notes publicly, I've had numerous situations where people kind of say, "Oh, actually, I don't, that's not what I meant. Could you go back and correct that?" Um, and so that's another good strategy for making sure that we're on the same page with and kind of sharing power with constituents. Okay. So lastly, we've made it to the final step uh, in the process, and that is course correct. So this is when we make changes in response to the feedback that we've received and report back to constituents the result of our feedback effort. Uh, as you know, it lets clients know that their feedback was successfully received and considered. Uh, it's a crucial building block for establishing trust and engendering more candid and useful feedback over time. Uh, and it's critical to close the loop by asking for any additional feedback uh, that people might have on the feedback process itself. So I have a few examples here uh, that I wanna quickly share of uh, what dialogue looks like in different contexts and some examples of reporting back. So first, um, taking a look here at the Siegel Family Foundation, after closing their online survey process, the foundation hosted 90 minute Zoom meetings with about 20 incubator participants to share feedback results, ask probing questions and identify course corrections to improve their social impact incubator in Rwanda and Malawi. The team used a PowerPoint presentation to share graphs and qualitative uh, feedback results, um, which were a result of pulling out key themes from open text analysis. And the focus was on getting participants to be as specific as possible about their feedback and ideas for course correction. So in this instance, they had found that a lot of the feedback they received was pretty high level, and they wanted to use the dialogue to really dig deeper and get some very specific recommendations. So one example of that is as a result of the dialogue, the Siegel Family Foundation revamped its learning visits. Um, they had been conducting site visits as staff, but they heard from their participants that they actually wanted to visit one another. Um, and do site visits to each other's organizations. That was a really specific actionable change that they were able to make as a result of the dialogue, but something that did not surface during the initial collection phase, for example. Another example of dialogue is uh, from Global Fund for Children, which created a youth leadership council to serve as advisors to the organization and to help clarify feedback from its broader community. 
The organization hosts regular dialogues with its youth leadership council to inform its program uh, and pro programs and strategies. Um, and so this is a, an ongoing existing group that they can tap to both help them design feedback processes for their broader community, but also make sense of the feedback that they're hearing uh, from other grantees. And then lastly, uh, this example comes from Ground Truth Solutions, which uses a community chalkboard to report back and ask follow-up questions of the broader community. Um, so for example, they might post a comment like, X percent of the community feels this way and ask, why do you think that might be? Um, so this is a way to have a very public uh, dialogue um, and just another way to get creative with each of the phases of the loop. Um, so what, what we're doing here is we, we surfaced an insight from the collect and analyze phase that we want more information about. And so we're going back to the community through this dialogue phase to ask a follow-up question. Okay, and so the last example I wanna share uh, is what it looks like to report back. So uh, here's an example of one of my favorite methods of reporting back. I think it's really simple and easy to use. If you ever participate in a Feedback Labs um, crash course, for example, or come to our summit, this is almost always how we will report back to you on the changes we plan to make. And so you can see here, the organization has said what we heard. Uh, what I think is great here is people can see their voices reflected here. They can see, yes, I did say that uh, in my survey, or I did say that in the dialogue. So we have heard you, and here's the change that we plan to make as a result. So for example, this organization heard that participants need access to mental health services. So they've made free counseling services available at all of their locations. Uh, as you're reporting back, you might find that there are things you heard that you don't plan to act on. And I think it's equally important to report back on that. And that might be a space to share why you don't plan to act on that change. Um, or you can share how you plan to continue to collect additional information to inform decision-making around that change in the future. As you're reporting back, some other things to keep in mind, which actually I see a really good example of this in this slide too, is uh, providing deadlines and timelines uh, in association with your course corrections. You can see here um, that they mentioned specifically July 2nd. Um, I often like to tie course corrections to key touch points that are already taking place, like um, you can expect that change to take place at our next summit, which is taking place in February, 2023. And so, people receiving that report from us know that when they come to the summit, they should expect to see evidence of that change, for example. Um, so thinking about what are deadlines that we can put in place to hold ourselves accountable, but also so that our community knows realistically when to keep an eye out for that change in our work. Okay, I know that was a lot of me talking about the feedback loop. Um, the last slide I just wanted to put up on the screen is, um, common feedback challenges. Um, so we know that this is tough. Um, that there are, there's a lot of uh, learning potential here and we're all growing together. Uh, and so some common things that we hear organizations uh, struggle with as it comes to feedback um, are first, low participation, um, particularly for marginalized groups. Um, and so one way to tackle that is through building buy-in upfront um, and as I mentioned, that contextualized and appropriate design. Um, and again, you might find that over time, as you demonstrate your commitment to act on the feedback that you receive, your participation rates go up, um, particularly as you uh, report on changes that you've made and then using that as a, a launching point for asking for additional feedback. Um, next, we often hear buy-in from leadership as a challenge. Um, and so, one strategy might be starting small and proving the worth of feedback, um, involving leadership from the start, even if they are skeptical, kind of asking them, just give me this chance. Let me, let's try it out and see what it looks like. Um, and then using peer case studies like the ones that we've talked about today, which I'm happy to share more of, and there's a whole slew of them available on our website. We've also heard a challenge around struggling to act on feedback. Um, and I think this has a lot to do with buy-in from staff and leadership, really understanding upfront the amount of work that it does take to act on feedback and building that expectation in upfront, uh, establishing a clear scope that's focused on what we really can change and 
making sure that we clarify feedback through dialogue so we really know what people want to see from us. And then lastly, putting a process in place from the start to act on feedback and report back. Um, so building that into our timeline, for example. And then lastly, we hear folks share um, a challenge around neglecting to report back. You're like, I've made it this far. I've done all of this work. We've made all of these changes. It's hard to find the time to send that final newsletter um, or to um, make that final announcement at an event, for example. Um, and so again, incorporating that into your design up front so people know we're not done yet until we've kind of checked that final box. Communicate that you will be reporting back um, to create accountability. So I put almost always in all of my surveys when people can expect to hear back from me. Um, so when I'm launching my first survey, I will say, so for example, we just did a series of interviews with our partners. We told everyone, you'll hear the results of this in December. So I know I need to report back in December in order to hold myself accountable to what I've committed. Um, and then lastly, put time on your calendar to report back. Um, make sure that, it, that it's something that's on your schedule. Um, and of course, happy to hear more about other challenges that you might be experiencing within your organization. Um, so I know we only have a little more than 10 minutes left, but I'm really eager to hear what questions you might have, um, how this resonates with your experience at your organization, um, and, and what else you'd like to learn. So thanks, everyone. Thank you so much, Alexis. That was uh, an excellent presentation, a lot to take in. Um, before we open it up to questions, you're welcome to un just unmute yourself and ask or put something in the chat um, or raise your hand. But um, since we're speaking about feedback, I will be putting a link for a very, very short feedback form uh, about this specific webinar. Uh, it's really helpful for us to hear um, what you think about the webinar and how we could potentially do something different so we can close the loop on you. So if you could take a minute and a half after this webinar to respond to the survey, we would appreciate it. Um, and Alexis uh, is kindly has kindly agreed to stay on a few minutes after the hour. So if you do want to, um, you know, ask a few more questions, feel free. So thank you, and opening it up to you. I have a question. Can yes, Tamar. Great. Tamar from Project Ten. Um, I I wanted to know. The, because we give our surveys at the end of a program and then we don't have the same people again, is it important for us to let them know the changes we'll be making for the next group? Or is it because like, I feel like it, it won't affect them anymore. So is it, still, is it still a step? And the second thing we noticed, because we're doing lots of surveys, we're trying to see each survey, each survey tries to see something else. And we know that that makes them lose motivation to fill it up seriously. Um, but you know, like every donor will want to have a short survey. Every, every, um, you know, every, like for marketing, we want to have a different kind of survey. Then we're doing a survey to see from like the Jewish agency, it just many surveys. And then they either don't fill them or they just don't take them as seriously. So those are my two questions. How do we get them motivated? And if it's not going to be the same people getting, should we reach out, make an effort, let them know the changes that they had? Because, oh, sorry, I'll just add that it can also have the other effect where they are upset. They're like, oh, for them, like, oh, the next group will have it better and stuff like that. Or like, why didn't we do it in the beginning? So is it even, is it even positive? Anyway, thank you. Yeah, great questions. Um, so keeping in mind, I don't know very much about your programs, um, but I have some, some thoughts for you. Um, first, uh, I would say yes, it's valuable to report back on the changes that you make um, to build a rapport and build a reputation for your organization as one that uniquely acts on feedback. So I think we all answer surveys after things that we then never hear anything about. But think how unique it would feel to get an email a few days later to say, this is what we heard from you, and this is what we plan to do differently next time. Um, I also think another way uh, to address concerns around people feeling like, oh, well, I didn't get that better version of that program or that workshop is to share upfront changes that you've made as a result. Um, so for example, this webinar is one that I deliver often and would love 
your feedback on and will genuinely incorporate changes as a result. And some things that I've done differently are I've gone into a lot more detail about each of those phases of the loop. I've shared a lot more tips and examples because those are things that have come up that people have surfaced for me in, in feedback surveys in the past. Um, and so uh, I, I often like to share, in this case, yeah, Elle is going to be sending out a feedback survey, which is great, but in instances where Feedback Labs does our own survey, I often like to share changes that I've made to the webinar that everyone in this group got to benefit from because of feedback from past participants. Um, so that might be something that you share as you introduce your survey. You might say, today's workshop or the recent program you participated in is better in the following ways because of the feedback we've received in the past. Help us continue to make it better by sharing your feedback. We will let you know what changes we plan to make based on the feedback that we hear from you. And I do think that long term that will have a big impact on, on the reputation for your organization as one that truly acts on the feedback it receives. Um, also, I don't know how long your programs are or if these are workshops, but um, there are opportunities to do rapid feedback activities kind of midway. So for example, we have a, um, a, a four week crash course on feedback and we do a feedback activity halfway through after the second session. Um, which is, it's called the plus delta activity, where we ask everyone to name what's one thing that's going really well that you want to make sure we continue to do, and what's one delta, one thing that we should change. And then based on that feedback, we do a rapid analysis. We identify maybe five things we can do better in the second half of the course, and we make those changes to the remaining two sessions of our course. Um, we share all of that back through the same email communications we're using to let people know about things like their homework for the course. Um, we also share it again in our presentation in the following session, just to say, here's what we heard from you. Here are the changes we plan to make. And so you might think about, are there opportunities uh, to do kind of midpoint um, feedback to adapt as you go, recognizing there are some things you aren't going to be able to change and you can let people know, thanks for that. Next time, we'll make sure to pick a different venue or uh, you know, like make sure we all have microphones, uh, which might not be something you can address in the moment. Um, and then your second question was about having a lot of different surveys from different donors or different entities. Um, again, I'm not super sure of the context, but um, I do think survey fatigue is real. And so thinking about um, are there ways for you to um, like aggregate some of that data on be, or some of those questions on behalf of your constituents or reduce the, the frequency of asking for feedback? Is there a way for you to um, kind of establish standards with your partners so that they know anytime you ask my constituents for feedback, I'm going to want to share with them what comes of it or the, the results? Um, uh, this is actually a really interesting thing that's been servicing lately, particularly as it relates to equity. So um, recently at our, our most recent summit, uh, a coalition of Black-led organizations shared that they have now established kind of standards for um, answering feedback surveys that come from different donors, um, essentially to say, like, we have lived experience that we will share with you if you ask us for feedback in the following respectful ways, which I thought was really interesting and, and demonstrates that people have felt like they were so constantly asked for experience and knowledge based on their lived experience that wasn't really, they weren't hearing what happened as a result, they weren't seeing changes in their community as a result. Um, so just want to validate what you shared that like that can be challenging when you have a lot of requests for data, a lot of requests for surveys. Um, and happy to continue to think more about that uh, as, a, a, as like that unique context and circumstance. Um, if you want to stick around after and tell me more, we can, we can talk more about that. Thanks, Alexis. I'll just say, I, I wonder if the different types of survey would matter. So sometimes it'll be, you know, written, sometimes be like a survey online and others, the first 10 minutes of your, you know, team meeting or whatever, you ask verbal questions. So maybe mixing up the way you deliver it might make it a bit more interesting. Um, we do have a, a, another question in the chat from Macaulay, if I said that correctly. Um, what strategies can you suggest for including constituents in the feedback process while minimizing time energy burdens on them? Yeah, that's a great question. So I do think uh, advisory councils are a great way to do this. So I mentioned um, the Global Fund for Children has a youth leadership council. 
that works with them to design their feedback process and then make sense of the feedback that's received. I know, for example, the T. Rowe Price Foundation piece out of Baltimore does the same. Um, those are individuals that have said, yes, for a year or two, I want to, to kind of play this advisory role um, and act as a resource for you. Um, so that might be something to consider. Um, others might be thinking through, um, yeah, who are especially engaged constituents, who are kind of folks who've um, volunteered their time in this way. Um, although that may not, that might mean that you're going back to the same people over and over and, and therefore kind of missing marginalized perspectives, which are critical for our, our design. Um, that's a really good question. I think it depends on your context. Um, some strategies that we have seen work for other organizations are compensating people for their knowledge and expertise and time. Um, so simply offering, can we offer you an honorarium to advise us on this feedback process briefly? Um, um, depending on the scope of the feedback process, it might be kind of convening a small group just to say, hey, can we have a quick call? I'd love to ask you some questions or test out the survey with you. Um, again, depending on your feedback design, happy to talk more about what that could look like for your specific organization. Thank you. Um, I know that some people may have to, to drop out at the end of the hour. Um, so thank you again for coming. Uh, we hope to see you in our next um, Aspire webinar and please take a minute to take the survey. Uh, and for those who want to stick around um, with more questions, you're welcome to for a few more minutes. Um, is there anyone who has a question to add? I had a question, if that's okay. Um, uh, first of all, also a, a comment or maybe a suggestion following what Yael said earlier about um, doing different types of feedback uh, or different um, forms of feedback. One thing that Sorry, I'm Avigail. I'm director of short programs at the Arava Institute, and we run uh, different study groups and workshops from anything from two hours long to two months long. Um, and it's not always, it's usually, it's never returning people. Uh, it's rarely returning groups. So like I might have a group from a university in America that comes, uh, but then I'll never see that university again. Um, and so I, I, Tamar's question before resonated with the the feedback that you might never see the people again um but something that we had from a group was uh, a form of feedback where we put into a hat like all the different sessions that we had the, the names of the different sessions that we had throughout the um th uh, three-week workshop and it was planning we were planning just everybody pull out a name of a session in the hat and just give uh, feedback, their own feedback for that specific session. Uh, but then it turned into a game of charades by accident when the first person didn't realize what we actually wanted to do. Uh, so it was actually a really fun form that we've started doing with some of our younger groups that come where we put the names of sessions into the hat and they have to guess what the session was and it reminds them, takes them back and then give feedback. So that was really fun. Um, but a question of mine was, what happens when you're kind of stuck in a weird positive negative feedback loop. So I have a group that comes, they give negative feedback about a session that they had. We take it out for the next time. And then the next group says, oh, we wish we had a session like this. And then we put it back. And then it's like, we, this has definitely happened to us before. Yeah, I feel you. Um, I've been in that exact situation. <laughs> um, I uh, so I think that there's also something to um, remembering that like when feedback happens, um, and I know we call it feedback, so it always sounds like it has to happen after the fact, but there's also feed forward or listening, um, which are ways to kind of gather insight before something takes place. Um, so you it might be interesting to think about based on that experience um, and that we know that different audiences have different needs, is there a way for us to ask for input upfront? Um, what, what are some questions that we might ask or what's it even a quick, so what are some questions we might ask followed by a quick conversation with that audience or representatives of that audience about the needs of this particular group that might inform our design. Um, so for example, we now um, have kind of, not an application, but uh, like a expression of interest type form for some of our courses where we ask questions to, that help us answer 
essentially this challenge. Like, are, are we about to be joined by a group of people that want a lot of reflection time in our sessions? Or are we about to be joined by people that like want a download of a bunch of data, like, and give me all the knowledge and speak to me a ton. Um, and so kind of using that like feed forward opportunity or listening in advance might help you contextualize based on the, the incoming group. Although I know that that has some challenges for standardization, um, but that might be a strategy to use. Um, and then also love the charades example that you just shared. What a creative idea. Um, also, even just getting feedback on different sessions and pulling those names out of a hat. I, uh, while you were talking, was thinking of a, a great resource that I can share in just a moment that is like a PDF of like 30 different creative feedback methods, mostly targeting young audiences um, that are much more interactive than a standard survey. They're the types of things that I like to do like mid-course or mid-workshop. Um, so I'll, I'll pull that up in just a moment and share that in the chat box. Thank you very much. Um, Alexa, I wanted to ask for organizations that have not systemized the feedback loop process, may have done it ad hoc. Um, and also for those that don't have necessarily a monitoring and evaluation specialist, you know, it's a very small team. What would you say is the first next step? Like, how do you, if, if it's so overwhelming, all this process, what should they do as a starting point? Yeah, um, and that's like always my biggest fear that people will come away from this feeling really overwhelmed because it can also be so simple. Um, and so I would encourage you to start really small. Um, I think that example that I just shared of like a midpoint survey where you're like, we're going to adapt kind of in the moment, the things that we really can change. We're going to have a rapid conversation about what that looks like. We're going to set ourselves accountable to a particular timeline. Um, so for example, what that looks like is we've got a clearly defined audience. It's a group that goes through a course with us. We do what I just described that plus Delta activity, which kind of provides both the opportunity for collection and dialogue kind of in the moment. People share initial thoughts with us. We ask follow-up clarifying questions. It takes about 20 minutes to do the entire dialogue. And from that, we've got a whole list of ideas for things to change. We're immediately able to turn that into that what we heard, what we'll do document um, and report back to people. Um, here's what we, yeah, like I said, what we uh, heard from you. Here are the changes we can and can't make. Um, and then we take the next two sessions and we make those very tangible changes. That all, like that entire process takes place in about a week. We like have the conversation one Tuesday, we're reporting back to them and already have incorporated a lot of changes into the course design by the next Tuesday. Um, I've also done it in the middle of workshops. So like before lunch, we do the activity. During lunch, I make the slide where I report back. After lunch, I report back and we make some changes that afternoon. Um, so starting out small, and seeing what can this really look like? What can an entire closed feedback loop look like um, kind of on a more granular level? Um, I think will then give you the confidence that you need to go bigger. And then, then you can start kind of carrying out larger scale um, surveys, for example, or interviews or focus group discussions um, that might lead to larger programmatic changes. And ultimately we're hoping to get to a place where we're making strategic decisions. What are the real needs of the communities that we're serving? Our, is our strategy meeting those uh, those needs? Are we having the impact we think we're having? If not, how do we adapt? But we don't need to start there. We can start smaller, build that kind of um, capacity and skill set, um, and then kind of get to that bigger vision over time. And hopefully, we are like doing this more rapid cyclical feedback process. Um, so we're just kind of building a comfort uh, with with feedback um, as we kind of move through that spectrum of like super small granular to larger strategy conversations. Uh, I would, uh, thank you, that was very helpful. I would just add that for many of our partners, you don't necessarily have the group, the constituents right there in the room with you in a workshop. It's often headquarters, you know, are working on projects and communities far away. And so maybe the first step could be to bring in a local staff who will, you know, move it from headquarters to the local community and be the one to, you know, take on that first feedback session or, or questions and answers um, in that community. Um, and that also helps kind of shift the power to there rather than staying with uh, just the headquarters. 
Yeah, and actually, uh, again, that example of Children International, I think, um, is a really good example of that. They they started off with small scale pilots where they said, let's do a rapid feedback process in three months. So we're going to give ourselves like a limited amount of time. They identified a few um, staff members that um, played different roles within the organization in an effort to kind of facilitate that buy in um, between like finance and programs and um, like social work um, and brought in a few folks and said together, because of our kind of collective knowledge, let's design and implement this rapid feedback process. We're not going to be able to get feedback from every constituent we work with. So let's let's target a particular community center, for example, or parents that are supported by this particular program. And we're going to do an in-person survey every day after school on this week. Um, and from there, we will kind of generate our initial collection. We'll be able to analyze those results and we'll have a single dialogue at the end of that after school program. Um, and so again, just thinking small about how do we, who is a, a concentrated group of folks that we can engage, um, where we can learn from, we can build these muscles and skills. Um, we can kind of also reflect on what it means to do feedback. What did we learn about the process and experience itself? Um, and then kind of continue to go bigger as we build confidence in our ability to, to implement feedback. Thank you. Anyone else questions, comments, or something that you have experienced yourself around feedback? Or Alexis, if there's any last words of wisdom that you want to share. Sure. I was also going to mention, I, I know I talked about our tools repository, but that's another great place to start if you are looking for a tool or even um, a tool provider that will give you a little bit more guidance or coaching with your feedback process. Um, so it includes tools that do SMS, that do paper surveys, that do um, email surveys or even phone like phone call surveys um, or like that do um, like listening and stories, not necessarily surveys, for example. Um, and even looking through that might trigger some thoughts on, you know, for our unique organization's context, what type of feedback process makes sense. Um, and then lastly, um, actually, maybe I'll just really briefly share for the folks who are still here. Um, if this is something that excites you and interests you, um, Feedback Labs was created to build a community around this conversation. Um, and hopefully you can see my presentation again. Um, so we spend all day, every day talking about this and are really eager to um, support organizations on their journey to strengthen their feedback process. So um, if you are looking for more resources or support, I'd love to invite you to become a free member. Um, that simply means you're signed up for our newsletter and invited to opportunities to learn with our members. Um, free ways to do that would be to participate in our biweekly lab storms. Um, these are creative problem solving sessions where a feedback practitioner brings a challenge they're facing in their work and others in the community kind of listen to their presentation and then rally around them by sharing ideas and recommendations. If you have a feedback challenge that you'd like to bring, we're always looking for great presenters. Um, and it is a good way to kind of get some input and advice from others who've thought about this before. Um, I also mentioned that crash course. We do um, we do occasionally offer these public crash courses where we take organizations through the experience of designing an entire closed feedback loop. Um, it involves a little bit more coaching, more examples, um, more group work, obviously, than we can do in an hour long webinar. Um, and so if you, are looking to design a feedback process that's custom to your organization, that might be something to consider. Our next crash course is in person in Atlanta in February. And we'll likely be offering a, a virtual crash course in April and then fall of next year. Um, and then lastly, um, we also have a, an annual summit where organizations essentially present on their, their feedback processes. Um, so if you're like, this sounds really cool, I'd like to learn more about this, um, you might consider joining us in Atlanta um, in February for our annual summit. And I know Yael is going to share all of that in the follow-up email, um, but just wanted to share, um, my hope is that you don't walk away feeling like this is daunting, but instead exciting. And the potential is there to really build 
relationships with constituents that inform your programs, that make them even more effective, more equitable. Um, and at the end of the day, you can feel even more confident, like, yes, we are having the impact that we hope to have. I feel that feedback really takes the guesswork out of our work. Instead of sitting around kind of being like, huh, I wonder what they want. Or like, why isn't anyone showing up for this thing? Um, why are people using that like software we built them? Um, it instead is that chance to partner with constituents to make those decisions together. And so I think it's really exciting and cool and would love to continue to talk with others about it. Um, and also I'll throw my email in the chat. So um, if nothing else, feel free to reach out to me and I'm happy to, to talk more about your organization or um, the different ways we could support you. Thank you. I love um, just seeing passion for feedback, not something you see every day, but this is actually very exciting work. Um, thank you so much. Thanks to everyone who took the time to be with us. Um, again, I'll send out the presentation, the recording, um, and hope this is something you can bring to your colleagues and have um, good conversations around. So um, yeah, thanks everyone and hope to see you all soon and have a good rest of your day. Thanks everyone.